Hello and welcome to my retro watches. My name is Mike and today we are featuring another Seiko on the channel uh, and it's a movement that I've actually filmed before as well in the archives if you went all the way back probably in my early days I think. Movement on this one is a 6309. The thing is this is a Seiko with a story and I love a Seiko with a story plus I'm going to be filming it on my new microscope if you saw the review which was the last video in sequence got my other camera set up as well so the plan is just to try and learn a little bit more about this while I go along as well so I want to take the movement apart try and find out what's wrong with it and uh, narrate over the top of that really the story behind this watch it's been sent in by a guy called Darren now I don't or I'm not at the moment being taken on any work from either viewers or just people who email me to ask working on watches. Certainly since my cancer diagnosis last year and then the treatment and everything else, I didn't want the stress of other people's watches. But this one came along, got a compelling story, plus I thought I could do it justice. And when they're sentimental things, I kind of feel a little bit obliged to try and help people where I can. Uh, we all have emotions attached to objects and I think that's quite important. And if I can be that person that puts it right and puts those memories back for somebody I think that it makes everything worthwhile to be honest with you uh, so without further ado let's cut to the cameras on the bench you'll see the watch and I'll disassemble it and hopefully it's just something very straightforward that's made this one stop so here is the watch it's a very typical Seiko 5 of its era nothing too fancy like I say, there's a lot of sentiment though it capsulated into this watch. And it's seen a bit of action as you can see. The, script, the crystal's quite scratched. Has this interesting sort of fracture or something of the crystal down the bottom here. Crystal appears to be acrylic. Can't seem to get the watch to move. Uh, Darren said it does move, but there we go, it is ticking this time. Every time I've shook it so far, <laughs> it's never ticked. And then on camera, it decides to waken up. Uh, so there we go. Um, but yes, it's not running as well as it should then in that case. If we turn it over, there we go, it says Darren. We have the movement, 6309-8970 is the case reference. If you're working on Seikos or you're buying Seikos, always cross-reference that number. Put that into Google image search. It'll come up, hopefully, with the same watch. Um, if it doesn't, usually these ones that are coming from India and such like, well, any watch really, may have a different case back, the actual design of the watch. Some other ways to tell that, actually. A bit of education for you down here as well. So you've got 6309 on the dial. These numbers here, can't read those very well, 894M, something like that. That is the dial code. Obviously, that's the movement number. So if the movement number uh, is correlating with the one on the back, you've got a good chance. And like I say, if image searches come up with the same watch as well, uh, then you know that you've got the right dial case back and everything combination. This is the main reference number. The seven on this particular model is referring to 1987. And the nine is the month, which is September. So we are September 1987. Uh, that has a bit of a attachment as well. There's a lot of sentiment in this watch, as I'll tell you in the story. So for now, let's just get the hands off and uh, start disassembling the movement. I will say, actually, quickly, it's always difficult when I hold it up because I've got to refocus everything, is that this crown is particularly... I'm putting a lot of force into that to get that to come out. And even now, it's only at the date change. There we go, finally, we're at the hand change. So in advance, I'm gonna wind that to make it easier for us to take the hands off. Here's the case back, and there's no service marks that I can see visible in there. So it's a good chance I'm the first person to work on this watch, possibly since Seiko. But then I say that, and there'll be a little clue a little bit later on in this video as to am I really the first person in this watch. So let me tell you a little bit about Darren. Darren got this watch from his parents for his 18th birthday. Now it was back in 1988. Now the question is, do we all 
get a watch for our 18th birthday because I know I did. Uh, I got a Citizen Quartz, which I still got to this day. I'll put a photo of it up. And uh, yes, I had to fix it as well, only recently. Now then, um, Darren was an apprentice Sparky back then. Now, Sparky is an electrician. Uh, but four months later, he joined the on-call fire service, which is basically a part-time fireman. Now, Darren's father was an ADO in the fire service, and that stood for an assistant divisional officer. In today's ranking, I believe, according to Google, that is a station manager. So once he joined the fire service, in Darren's words, that's when the watch started to get a battering. Now, indeed, mate, I'm sure doing that job, a watch is going to get lots of bangs and knocks and all kinds. But more importantly, that's when the memories started building. Uh, Darren did his first three code blues whilst wearing this watch. And I'm sure if any of you have been in the emergency services, you probably can all remember your first uh, code blue, I'm sure. Um, now, in 1991, Darren became a full-time fireman and the watch had seen loads of action by then, but then also did an extensive 16 weeks training course uh, to become a full-time fireman. But back then in the early 90s, the fireman's kit in the UK was not what it is today. Uh, plastic leggings, uh, donkey jackets and poor quality gloves uh, that didn't have any wrist protection. And that meant that the watch would have to be quickly removed uh, during a fire because otherwise he'd get blisters on his arms from the sheer heat of the fire. Um, the removal of that watch over and over again uh, one day failed when he was lifting somebody out of a car and the watch fell off. So he had to fit a different strap, a quick release strap, as he says, and then he would take it off and store it in his boot of all places. You wouldn't think you'd put it in a, in a boot, would you? In 1996, the uh, crystal got chipped and that was while he was setting up a fire hydrant in the small hours for a house fire in the middle of a road. And I can imagine that's quite a frantic procedure to do when there's lives at stake. And alas, the crystal got broke. But he continued to wear it. But by the early 2000s, the watch was beginning to have poor timekeeping. So he had to take it off and put it into the to be fixed pile. So as we can see, the watch is running. I did put it on the time graph, it doesn't really pick up a beat. And um, a little bit of further investigation, if we turn this onto its side, you can see quite clearly there, there's a really big wobble going on. So that could be a balance staff, um, hairspring, all kinds really. Um, now why it's doing that, I'm not sure. Trying to sit, just trying to see if the hairspring is touching the balance cock, but at this angle it's hard to tell. Uh, now, if it's a balance staff, at the moment, I'm not gonna attempt that change, um, but I do have spare balances for this particular movement. Um, but we'll find out. Just seeing a bit of dirt there, and wondering where that is, that hair. Let's continue with the disassembly. Back to the story then. So sadly, in 2020, Darren lost his brother, who was also a fireman. Um, and he was sitting with his parents, uh, looking back at old photographs of them all. And the watch kept standing out. So he decided then that he had to go and get the watch fixed. So he sent it off to a watch repairer who then stuck it on a machine, didn't remove the case back, didn't do anything, and then gave it back to him five minutes later saying, now nah, mate, it doesn't tick, it's not gonna tick. Now I find that absolutely unbelievable. Uh, did the guy think it was a quartz or something? I mean, how, uh, well, how naive and terrible is that really? Now the movement has stopped. Look at the hairspring. So that is, to me, that terminal curve there, something's wrong with the hairspring. Uh, we'll disassemble the movement and we'll keep it on the microscope and have a good look at that balance, I think. Cool. 
that screw is extremely loose. So, it's kind of interesting. Why is the barrel all scratched up like that? Very peculiar. What I do like about these, I haven't been in a, 6 a 6309 for ages, is the wheels are coordinated with the holes. So there's a fourth wheel, which we'll remove. And it's the third wheel with three holes. Nice and simple, straightforward but good thinking. Now back in 2022, uh, Darren's father became increasingly uh, frail and unwell. He sadly got dementia and they've nearly lost him twice actually. So Darren wanted to get the watch running uh, because of all of that sentiment it holds, but also to see if it was gonna stir some memories uh, for his father so he sent it to another shop uh, who then said that they sent it to Seiko Seiko sent it back saying they didn't have any parts to repair it um, and then the shop sent it to an enthusiast who also sat on it then for a number of months uh, and said it needed parts well sorry I find that complete and utter bullshit um, not from Darren's point of view but for, from the, the, the repairers and Seiko. It's a 6309 movement. You can buy one of these tomorrow on eBay for £20 and you'd get all the parts that you need. And that's why I had to take this job on. It's got all of his memories in this watch, but it's also to see if it's gonna spark anything for his father. And honestly, I've been touched by the story, but I'm also pleased that I'm the one that can help this become a reality because one thing's for sure Seiko's do not die and this one will run again so there we have a stripped movement and the main plate looks fine to me um, all the parts except for the balance seem reasonable scratches on that um, uh, barrel which is a bit odd so let's have a look at the hairspring and the balance so here is the balance, We're starting with the staff at the top here and the microscope can just about pick that pivot up. Now I can't see it, that it's bent from here, it looks okay. If we then focus down onto the hairspring, well you know, you tell me, what do you think you see? Um, to me, the coils are all just a bit too close here, aren't they? Uh, it's not magnetised, it doesn't appear to be magnetised but it just seems to be a bit, a little bit of out of sync. And that could be that it needs a nudge. It's almost like we need to sort of push it over a little bit like that. Um, as you can sort of do from here, look, see. Um, it might be just we need to move the stud even. Um, at the moment, I'm not gonna mess around with it. I'm gonna clean the parts to start with and um, a little bit more investigation required I think. The problem you have or I have with these there's two types of balance you get on 6139s you get ones with a nice easy stud so you can remove the hairspring and everything else or you get one like this so you got that nice little screw there and it clamps it and the thing with this is that that's the length of the spring so it all is determined by where you position it in there as to how much in beat it's going to be and everything else and I don't want to start messing around moving the collet around and things like that um, so we'll try and see if we can do a correction um, if moving the, 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 the stud here doesn't do anything uh, but I don't want to do anything too fancy hairspring work is something I still <laughs> require a lot more practice before I try and demonstrate it on camera uh, for the whole world to see just how bad I am at it. Um, so yeah, let's clean the parts.
So I'm now going to show you how I find the part numbers on this website here, Bowley, and I'll leave a link for this below. I'm going to type in the uh, Hattori reference here, and straight away it's given me the crystal code. I can click into that. It also gives me lots of other part numbers for various parts of the watch. It doesn't always show so comprehensive on each model, but on this one we're quite lucky. Um, so we can decipher that part number using a particular document that I've also got. And again, I'll be leaving a link below. So here's the PDF. Uh, it's from a Seiko manual from somewhere. And it gives you an idea of what all the letters and codings mean. But essentially these first numbers here, but the diameter. So the example there is it's um, 20 millimeters. If it said 201, it would be 20.1 millimeters. So now we know the part number, we can search for it on Cousins. Easy way to do that, over to Watch Parts, Branded, and scroll down to uh, Seiko. Similar thing, we need case parts this time, and we'll put in that same number. Search for that, comes up, click the dot, and we're searching for all the parts. So we can see there's some crowns. This is a gold version basically, and the stainless steel. The crystal is discontinued. So that is a problem, uh, but we know that it's 31 millimeters on this one. So if we click into that, it gives us a bit more information. Still referring to the case reference uh, so the crystal reference all the different models it's going to fit but equally down here the stern cruise if i'm pronouncing that correctly their reference for it they've got two different versions so all we need to do is uh, take one of those copy that give it a search and there it is that will be the crystal that I will buy for oops for this movement and I think by clicking it into it there I've ruined it so yeah just have to click buy there we go that's how I find the crystal for this one hopefully you found that useful okay here we go with the rebuild. Use a little bit of D5 just for the barrel bearing there. And then I'm pretty proficient, it has to be said, with uh, Seikos nowadays. I've done so many different movements, and this one is no exception. I've done this movement many times, but probably not for at least a year. So I am still a little bit rusty. You do re vaguely remember them. The thing is, generally, I do so many movements for the first time and then I honestly can't remember them. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to stick in my mind at all. So the plan here at the moment is just to build the movement up till we get to the point where we'd be putting the balance on and then we can address or have a look at the problem with the balance and see if we can fix it. So we're going to be there pretty quickly. Only a few parts really. I'm still getting used to using this uh, microscope as well, which is a bit of a challenge. You don't get the depth of field 
so I can't for instance judge where that pivot is very easily and I'm hoping that I will learn that skill as we go along and that will become a bit more second nature than it is right now so I just drop the click in place I'll try to I've elected not to change the barrel lid as you oops as you can see originality is always the key it clearly will work uh, so as much as I've got other lids I think I'll leave it in there for provenance so again this is the depth of field thing I'm telling you about so if I came down with my loop and my eye I'd be able to see exactly what I'm doing here And then we've got the third wheel that I've put in after the fourth wheel. So out that one comes yet again. I think I made this mistake on my last video. Uh, just not concentrating really. But of course I am just an amateur and I like to keep making that known. That this is not a professional job. I've just self-taught everything you see and um, trying to show to you guys really that it is possible to do hobbyist watchmaking quite uh, successfully with cheap watches. You don't have to get Rolexes and things like that to enjoy this hobby. You can buy uh, very affordable watches and have just as much fun. So this is where it's going to get a little bit interesting. Um, train wheel bridges on these are finickety is probably the right word just need to now put that click in I just need to get it in the right place and uh, I'm losing again all my peripheral vision here so it needs to fit in like that so it's all lined up but that isn't So I'll just try and support it with a little bit of peg wood. And I think I'll try and just use the oiler. Just to tease that, there you go. Now that's in the right place. That is a clean oiler, has no oil on it. So then it's lining up the pivots time. And this is what I normally do on a microscope. Um, doing it on this microscope I think I need to come in a little bit closer possibly although oh, I was going to say they're, lined, they're actually lined up and then I knocked it what you can see is the escape spins the fourth wheel spins but it's the third wheel I can feel resistance there we go I could feel resistance now the resistance has gone So I will say that screws are still particularly difficult under the microscope. So now we've got the pallet fork and I've used a little bit of fixer drop uh, on the ends of the pallet fork just to help it when I come to do some oiling. Now these are usually the worst things to fit pivot's always so small and again a microscope helps significantly that's all lined up already and it's usually quite easy to knock it out of position with the bridge 
but you have to have a light touch and a bit of patience. And I can tell you now that's straight on, so that's good. So people were saying recently that um, I'm known as doing Seikos and that I've done possibly far too many Seikos on the channel and I think it's kind of justified to say something like that. Uh, however, I have tried to count the other brands and there are still significantly more other brands than there were of the Seiko videos, really. Um, but there you go. I do have a fondness for these in part because, again, they're affordable. I like the designs. I like the robustness and the ease that you can work on these things and showing you guys, certainly anyone that wants to get into this hobby, how to, um, well, you know, tutorials and videos like this, I think it's very helpful, really. And as you can see, I'm really struggling with screws, uh, just looking at the microscope and not at what I'm doing. So I think for these and for speed, I'm going to remove it from here and do it with my loop. So that's all installed. Quick bit more of the D5 before I forget. Just for where the barrel arbor meets the uh, top plate there. Okay, so we can put the ratchet wheel on and keep going. So I'm trying to keep my chin up at the moment as well. The channel, certainly in 2023, seems to take a bit of a nosedive, to be honest with you. I know I've done a bit of reviews and uh, slightly different videos uh, to just the repairs. Um, but I enjoy doing everything. I enjoy uh, the repairs especially, but I like to show you different things and uh, you know, it um, varieties the spice of life. But I think as a result of that, uh, the algorithm has been punishing me severely. So I've seen uh, a drop of like nearly 50% of views, uh, which is sad, uh, especially after six years on the platform. I think I've been doing this a very, very long time and um, I can get envious uh, as daft as it sounds of other channels and I shouldn't do because I don't really do this. I couldn't do this for the money because trust me, the money you get from YouTube uh, does not put food on the plate uh, for a family, put it that way. Uh, not the sort of money that I earn anyway. Um, and when you think about this, so this service here to rebuild this watch may take uh, give or take, let's say three quarters of an hour, maybe an hour, uh, if I don't have any mishaps like that. Again, let me just do this one off camera. There we go. So yes, like I say, this would um, maybe take me an hour or so. It's taken a, another hour maybe to get set up. And this is just the rebuild this is not the disassembly then there's all the editing that goes on top of that uh, the stuff behind the scenes on youtube that you've got to try and get right so it's very very comprehensive very time consuming i do this all on the back of a full-time job and family um so a lot of this is filmed late at night like now it's half past 11 um and i'll be at this probably till at least half past 12. So it gives you some sort of insight into uh what we have to face, really, what we do. Um, so it's certainly not a gravy train, uh, but I enjoy it and I enjoy seeing your feedback in the comments. I get emails occasionally from people who have been incentivized uh, by what I do and have taken up the hobby. And honestly, that is absolutely fantastic because that's what it's all about. I've got a big piece of fluff on the end of the oiler. Look, look at that, see? So it's, you know, the comment section I really like, the um, the 
emails that I get, some of the questions I get. Um, the Facebook group, of course, huge community there. So a lot to, lot to be, a lot to be thankful for. What I'm slightly disappointed at is the clarity in which the f this film is going on the microscope. It doesn't look as clear as I would like. Anyway, there we are. Um, I'll stop waffling about uh, YouTube. This should now just click over. So we know that that's good to go. So it's all about the balance. And I'm going to put on the screen in just a moment a good balance and the balance has come out of this watch and we can compare and see what we can correct. Here we're looking at two balances. This one here is from our watch. This is one from one of mine um, in my collection. And to my surprise, they look pretty much absolutely identical, almost to exactly where the regulator is. Not a lot of difference. And the coils look the same. So. I'm thinking this is out, then that one must be out, but it can't be because I know this watch is running fine. Um, so trying to address the wobble, now I have looked at this pivot. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it on camera easily. We'll try. So we can just see it there. Really hard to get into focus. Should I put the other lens on? I'd say that pivot is fine. So I think what we'll do, we'll drop it in the movement and take the jewel out and have a look at the top pivot. That's probably the best way. And then obviously see if the movement's gonna run because maybe it isn't the balance that was causing the problem to start with. So again, fitting balances on the microscope is well, almost impossible. And uh, there's a prime example of it being completely in the wrong position in every way, shape and form. Well, that is interesting. Oh, I know why it's not spinning. <laughs> I'll put that screw in first. I haven't put the bottom jewel setting in. You plonker. Well, as I say in nearly every one of my videos now, you see the mistakes as they happen live. I do also think that some of you would have made exactly the same mistake. So you can now see it trying to <laughs> trying to run. So I've got to put the jewel in the, there. So just bear with me while I sort that out. Key thing is with these, closer magnification than what we've got really, always keep a pair of tweezers inside. And then that way, if it's gonna go anywhere, it should stay, you know, inside the tweezers, so to speak. There we go, that's in. And I can see the movement beating quite well on the other side. So it's begging the question, isn't it? Was it the movement or was it not the movement of the movement? What am I talking about? Was it the balance or not the balance? I think 
we'll flip it over okay so it's running all right looks fine to me to be honest with the acid test of course is going to be the time grapher but i do need to oil this jewel and i did want to also inspect the top pivot just to be sure there is still the wobble as you can see but from this angle now i can clearly see that the hairspring is fine that's not touching the bridge at all so it could still be that the pivot slightly bent um, so yeah let's just change the jewel get that uh, cleaned up and then the next shot you'll see will be the time grapher i'm guessing and the time grapher will be a bit of a nightmare because you've seen or maybe you haven't actually seen how crowded my bench is um, so i have to remove everything the uh, microscope a lot just to set that shot up so <laughs> another case in point about how long this <laughs> this takes so we'll just pop that jewel out there and i think i'll drop the microscope and we'll have a real good close look so there we see it it all looks pretty clean in there just trying to decide how round that hole is but i think it's a bit of an optical illusion to be honest with you they're very very close in yeah i think that's fine it always shakes around like crazy when you haven't got the shock jewel in so i'll clean that put it back in and we'll put it on the time grapher okay the camera angle is not the best um, however here we go Oh well, straight away off the bat, that's fine. Um, we've got serious beat error, we can deal with that. But we've got two, well, it's picking up a bit of noise, but I think that's probably me talking. Just take the gain down. These are pretty clear lines. Amplitude is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, that can be regulated. I see no problem with that at all. Quickly try it in a different position yep that's still following the same trend isn't it stick it up in the air like that a bit more dramatic but still okay and then finally dial down So those lines, as much as it looks <laughs> really uh, all over the place, they're all going in the right direction. So I don't see any problem with that balance, despite the fact it's got that bit of wobble on. So a bit of lesson learnt there, hopefully. If you know any different, tell me in the comments. Uh, I will regulate that, but of course I'll do that at the end. Well, a few days have passed. I let the watch run on my bench before coming back to finish the rebuild part of the video. And put it on the time grapher and look at what we're getting. So my naivety that that wobbly um, balance, which you can probably just see in the background there, uh, was all right, is clearly mistaken. Um, that is certainly contributing to the problem. Uh, you can see we've got a low amplitude, uh, a strange beat error, and the rate is appalling. And I have actually tried to regulate it, thinking that would cure the problem, and it's uh, it's definitely not. But I have a donor. I have this old watch here, which was in a closed case. And the movement on this one is absolutely mint. Um, shame about the dial and everything else. It might not might look all right on the uh, video. I don't know. But honest, it is appalling. Um, but it's come to the rescue for this one. We've got a good balance to put in. So I'll change the balance, put it back on the time graph. I won't change any of the parameters and you will see the difference one balance will make. So there we go, a new balance on. Not so worried about the rate gathering up there. This still needs a little bit of a tweak, uh, but you can see straight away that the beat error is proper, amplitude is right. No more winding the mainspring or anything. It's clearly the main issue was that balance. And I'm thinking it's 
possibly a pivot. If I get a chance, I'll take the hairspring completely off and uh, have a look um, at the balance staff. Maybe try and see that on the microscope. But I'll have to save that to the end. Let's now crack on with the uh, build. Darren, at this point, your watch is saved, mate. Um, I cannot really foresee any more issues with this one. And that's the main thing. I'm really, really pleased to be able to give you this back very soon. And now it's time for the dial side. Start off with the cannon pinion. Just a little bit of D5 there, ready for it. Always like the click. Install the clutch, and while we're at it, always a bit of fun trying to get hold of this um, peripheral vision that I've lost. What we can see here as well is the crown is quite bent, isn't it? Um, I may see if I can do something about that. Failing that, I might have a spare. So we've just got this little pin here. This, little, this is the uh, for the. It's stuck to my tweezers, but um, it is for the setting lever. So you press this from the other side, it lifts up the setting lever, which allows the uh, stem to come out. So just want a little bit of this blue grease, either side of the clutch really. In my last video, you saw me clearly over grease uh, because this is not my watch. I want to try and get it a bit better. It's a uh, nine four, sorry, it's nine five zero four Mobius. It's a synthetic grease. This one. Now I really wanted to grease in there, but I'll have to wait and try and do that a bit later. Actually, I can run a tiny bit of D5. Bit of a high friction point. Probably going a bit overboard. But I always think this is a really high friction place. Be hard to show you. There we go. So you can see all the different settings we've got. So happy with that. It's interesting to see these green parts. Got that part upside down. No, I haven't. You often see these all as nylon plastic, but um, they're normally sort of a grey colour. Occasionally you see the green ones. I don't know why that is, um, but <laughs> 
this one's green, fair enough. So we now have this part and always oh, fiddly, you've got to try, I believe you've got to try an oil in here. Trying to do it on the microscope is nigh on impossible. Trying to keep it in focus for you. I have no idea where the part is. And I think that was quite badly done. But I'll do it <laughs> off camera better. So if we just zoom in like that, and we'll just put a little bit on that pivot there as well. D5 on this post here. This is a really interesting little piece. Um, it's all to do with the quick set. So I can't demonstrate at the moment because we haven't got it screwed down. But essentially, as you pull the crown out here, it operates the setting lever spring and the setting lever. The setting lever will travel down here and will move this to where it needs to be and it will drive the date wheel and from memory it drives the day wheel as well. Really nice unique way of doing things that only Seiko know how. So then there was this part and I'm just going to put it on there. So yes, yeah, so that, that part there, sorry, that will drive the day wheel. I'm just wondering whether I should have put the hour wheel on first and yes I should and there we go you see see it all in action this little part here is seen in so many Seikos kind of holds the uh, date wheel in place and lets it click uh, over each time you need it, whether it's the quick set or the um, normal regular change. This is always the tricky part, trying to put a little tiny bit of D2, a D2, D5. Just along that contact edge there. This is where you can get your fingers in. I can see a hair look. This is the great thing about this microscope. It really does show things that I wouldn't normally see when I'm filming. So I hold the ring with my fingers, gently just pull that back. And there we have it. So we have two little cover plates to put on and that's pretty much the uh, this side of the movement done. I really want to get this watch running right for, for Darren. I love the story behind it. And I just like people holding sentimental value to items and me being able to restore them. It's like a little episode of the repair shop. If anyone, anyone from the UK is watching will know what the repair shop is. TV program that um, people bring things in, all kinds of stuff. It's always sentimental. Really, I'm struggling with a screwdriver in this microscope. I'm hoping again that's a skill that um, comes to me in time. Has so many benefits, certainly for filming and just for general 
uh, watchmaking or hobbyist watchmaking see a bit clearer what I'm doing um, I can record I can take photographs I can record and take photographs at the same time which is another cool feature That screws are in. I want to check it. And another typical feature for Seiko. This little spring here is all to do with holding in place the day wheel. So we put the day wheel on and then we have to look or where that is, maybe somewhere up here as you can see and then I just use an old oiler that I've got that's broken on the end it's got a big hair on it and we're just moving that back I'm struggling. There. Until it catches. And then we have what's called the C clip. And it says here Ring upward. Now, many times I've worked on Seiko's that have been worked on before, and people don't read that. Here is the C clip. This is upward. If I turn it the other way around, you might just be able to see it's got a chamfered or a beveled edge. And people put it that way because they think that's right, but it's not. That little tiny bevel is so you can pry it back off when the next service uh, schedule comes around. So there we are, that's in place and we will just Try to check that as well, which it works. So the movement's pretty much done. Just got to put the auto works on. Uh, then it's dial and hands. We're done. Okay, some D5 on the centre there. It's called the pull lever or the magic fingers. Incredible little bit of engineering. And this trust all is here to transfer all the power from the rotation. And this sort of seesaws, if you like, winds that gear around there, which in turn winds the ratchet and everything else to wind the mainspring. Another reason to love Seiko. Now the 6119 or the 6106 movements are um, have a screwed cover plate on these, but this one has a bit of plastic and I've got to remember its orientation which I can't off the top of my head I think it's I think it's like that isn't it now I'm not sure I've only got two pins so it has to be Yep, they're in. Oops, quick spot of D5 in there. Jewel looks like it's broken, but it's not. It's an optical illusion. The barrel runs underneath it. It threw me earlier on. I was looking at that thinking it's broken, uh, but closer inspection.
proved otherwise. Okay, they're all screwed in and if we try to put a little bit of wind into the main spring you can kind of see it in action. I'll try and do it with my fingers out of the way. And there you go. So this is this will wind around and turn that which turns all this drop a couple of bits of oil in there which i'll do off camera now um, just onto those teeth and that's it dial and hands time so now the moment of truth we'll get to see it tick again now the dial has got a few little blemishes marks and scratches over the years this is usually just wear and tear with Seiko, usually the lacquer. Um, with that chip and things like that, things happen. These little things that look like white dots, as you can see, they don't come off. They're just part of the age, I suppose. So let's fit the all important second hand. And the all important thing, will it clear the uh, minute hand? Yes, of course it will. Ah, well, there we go. Um, just a question of putting it in the case. And I'll show you the nice bracelet I've got for this one. Um, and shame, shame to that watchmaker who said they were waiting for parts and everything else. Um, I just don't get it. I really don't. It still makes me very angry that people pretend to take on jobs and then just don't do it. You know, when, when you've got somebody who's not really bothered about the price, you know, a service is going to outweigh the cost of what you could buy this watch for. But you can't buy those memories, can you? And, you know, if I was a professional watchmaker, and someone came to me, I didn't care what it was. If they were going to pay the money, my fee, then I'll service the damn thing. So... Anyway, there we go. Um, that's what us hobbyist watchmakers are here for when we can and able to offer services for other people. Right, let's get this cased, show you the finished watch. So I thought the crown was bent, uh, so I ordered a replacement crown and as you can see, it's not quite right. It turns out it was the stem that was bent. So luckily enough, I've got a spare 6309 a new old stock stem there we go so I just would have to trim that to length and just to sort of prove a point you can now see it in a pin vise just with that crown on the end uh, the cousin's part number or the recommendation they recommended is completely wrong it doesn't even have the right thread size so don't always go on what cousins say I also ordered up this bracelet from cousins it's a cheap folded bracelet but it came with a whole pack of uh, end links that are square different sizes I think 22 20 mil 18 uh, so very very versatile and I figured it looked a little bit like the original and as the original was broken let's try and put something a bit better on uh, of course Darren can always change it to a leather strap if he prefers so with that let's now reveal the finished watch 
here's the finished watch in all of its splendor in the British uh, sunshine. And yes, it's a basic Seiko 5. Um, I still think it's a very pleasant watch. I think that bracelet does kind of complement it, but of course it will go very well with just a black leather strap as well. But again, it's just the what this watch symbolizes. Certainly for Darren, you know, it's all of his memories and uh, certainly for his father as well. All that sentiment is just, well, really, really heartwarming. And I'm so pleased that I've been able to put right certainly what uh, Seiko can't put right, what a professional can't put right, and what potentially another hobbyist can't put right. And I'm curious to know out of all three of those who left the loose screws and who scratched the barrel itself as well. Uh, because I think of, out of all of those people, uh, none of them should be able to do that sort of damage, to be honest with you. Um, and from what I've actually heard recently about uh, Seiko service centres, uh, it could quite possibly be them, but uh, I don't want to cast any dispersions. Uh, I'm going to be really thrilled to post this back to Darren and for him to uh, see it all again and uh, live out those memories and make new memories with this watch also it's not its value it's all about that sentiment and i think we've all got uh, items like this and i'm just very pleased that again i can be the person to bring that back for darren so with that in mind this is the end of this video so i really do hope you enjoyed it i've put a lot of effort into this one certainly from a camera positions and from editing and so on and so forth i wanted to tell this story so i hope i've done it justice uh, so i'd really appreciate it if everybody who watches this far please hit that thumbs up because as i've said and had a little whinge the channel isn't doing so well at the moment and it can be a little bit disheartening at times uh, when you put all this effort in it doesn't seem to get the the pickup that you would like so please hit the like button if you've watched this video and you're new to the channel consider subscribing because there's more and more watches like this to come and there's already been 180 videos behind this one as well for you all to enjoy i'm going to welcome reading all of your comments down below so please leave plenty of those i read every single one try to reply to as many as i can so i'll be seeing you in the comments uh, very soon um yeah that's about it join the facebook group retro and vintage watches and restorations uh, check me out on instagram my retro watches i post on there regular of what i'm doing um yeah and stay healthy stay happy see you in the next video which is going to be the little uh 1923 omega that i've got to do uh that has also got a great story to tell and I'm going to be starting that video straight after this one has gone live. Thank you. Bye for now.